75% of Americans believe in UFOs. 30% of Americans believe UFOs are vehicles from other worlds. And 3% of Americans believe they have been abducted by aliens. That's over 8 million people. They're out there, aren't they? Welcome to the UFO Files Show with your host, Jerry Pippen. Hi, this is Jerry Pippen, and welcome to our show. Uh, today we're going to do something a little different. Uh, we're going to have John... Burgess back with us. We've done a couple of shows with him about the Wingmakers, and we'll do another one today. Only this time, John is going to do the show, along with his wife, Darlene Burgess. So stay tuned for John and Darlene Burgess. I think you'll enjoy what you hear. In the background, this is some music from the Wingmakers. You know, the Wingmakers not only uh, has uh, music and a few other things which John and Darlene will get into, but they have poems. And uh, this is one of my favorite Wingmaker poems. You can make up your own mind what the message is and what it's all about. I have my own ideas. Let's give it a listen. wanted to love was someone like you, someone who looks at the river frozen and knows underneath the current remains, someone who knows that when the sky is absent of color beneath the globe, another world comes to light. All I ever wanted was to love someone like you. Someone who can untangle my life in their golden light and steal my eyes, knowing I could never turn away. I could never turn away. Mexico, the treasures of the wingmakers. We'll be back here in a moment with John and Darlene Burgess as they talk about the wingmakers and what it's all about. But first of all, let's pause for these words. And then when we come back, it'll be John and Darlene's show today.
Welcome to Wingmakers Internet Radio, where we focus on the writings, music, art, and philosophy of the Wingmakers. Your hosts are Darlene and John Burgess. Join us as we explore new dimensions of thinking, feeling, and living in the 21st century. Hello, everyone out there. I want to welcome all our listeners to our first Wingmakers Internet Radio Show. I'm John Burgess. And I'm Darlene Burgess. And we're really happy to be here to do an experiment in Internet Radio and offer you, our listeners, information in all sizes and shapes, so to speak, about Wingmakers and uh, what it's trying to bring to humanity. Uh, The reason we wanted to do a Wingmakers radio show was to help uh, ground the material and offer people a chance to uh, give feedback about the material through emails uh, to us so that uh, we can get a two-way discussion going uh, about this very interesting and fascinating um, website called wingmakers.com and its sister site, lyricus.com. And uh, I have a few notes here about the mission Uh, of the show, and uh, I'll read them off for you. Uh, Number one was to facilitate people's understanding of the materials on the Wingmakers and Lyricus websites. Another reason is to build a sense of community and coherence among those interested in the materials, and we want to foster and encourage interest and research uh, in the main topic and main mission of the wingmakers themselves, uh, which, as we understand it, is to help humanity discover uh, the grand portal. Uh, The grand portal, of course, is a term that the wingmakers and the lyricist teachers use uh, to describe the scientific discovery of the human soul and the multidimensional reality in which we all live. I think that's a pretty worthy goal for all of us, and it's certainly something very exciting. Uh, Granted, it will probably have a limited appeal uh, to many, many people out there in the world, but we do know, uh, just from the Wingmakers Forum, which is online, that there are thousands of Wingmaker uh, aficionados, maybe we should call them, or enthusiasts all all over the globe, and this is maybe a good way to Uh, Get in touch with all of you out there through this show. Do you have anything you want to add to this, darling, these points? Well, maybe we should just give you a little background about who we are. Uh, Both of us have been interested in spiritual studies for many years. Uh, We've been students of meditation. Uh, We've studied many metaphysical and psychological topics. We've studied cosmology. Uh, we've self-published a couple of books. Uh, One of the books is called Sacred Vessel of the Mysteries, and another book is called Hidden Foundations of the Great Invocation. Uh, Both of these books uh, we did completely on our own and financed ourselves and published ourselves. John, wouldn't you say that in the process of doing the research on those books and the way in which you intuitive some of the information in those books led you to being able to recognize the importance of the Wingmaker's material when you first saw it on the website? Yeah, yes, I think that's uh, probably true. That's a good insight. I hadn't really thought of it that way, but um, that's probably true. The, the books I wrote, are about a, a world prayer that's coded with information. And it took a lot of um, reflection and deep insight and intuition on my own part to begin to uh, recognize that and fathom it and work with it. And uh, I think that uh, really did help me recognize something important about the Wingmakers material when we first saw it. And uh, we bought the first source disc and, and uh, recognized something very important in this material. But wouldn't you say that the internal journey that you took to uncover the many layers of 
encodement into that world prayer gave you the vision to be able to see the many layers and the encodement in the Wingmaker's material. Well, well, let's put it this way. I, I think there is a lot of coding in the material, and James himself has said that, and that's what this show is going to be about, and other shows, if we're able to do them, uh, will be about discussing all that. And I'm, I would not sit here and say that I have personally found codes in this material. Oh, but that's I've not certainly, what I was saying. Okay, that's... Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that for the audience uh, because we're not here to toot our own horns, that's right. for sure. But your your remarks are well taken, and I think they're valid in that um, uh, the, the whole would, essence of this is to develop our intuition. I think that's what Wingmakers is all about because it leads to the soul. What I was really saying, it gave you the tools. You then had a tool in which you were well aware of how encoded material looks like, feels like, and how you can get to the inner circle of that encodement material. And what I was saying is that not that you were able to discover the encoding of the wingmakers, but now you had a tool in how to help you discover the relationships in the encoding that you might see or might be uh, aware of or begin to see the broader picture of the big picture that the Wingmakers material gave you. No, I, I think that's true. I think that's very true. Um, and I would include both of us in that because you've certainly been here along the journey and done a lot yourself. And um, we, like I said earlier, we were both trained uh, as meditators. Uh, we've done, uh, oh, 10, 15 years of work in meditation at least and, uh, and more than that. And so... Um, I believe it prepared us at least to recognize something important about the Wingmakers material and the material on the Lyricus uh, website, which is the sister site of the main Wingmakers site. Although in the future it may be that the Lyricus site becomes more important than the Wingmakers, but that's a topic for later on. Uh, so why don't we... Um, so great, having said all that, I think uh, the next point here is to explain to the audience that we are not professional broadcasters, and that may be evident to our audience already. Uh, we're a couple of amateurs here in this, uh, in this regard, uh, but we're, we're making the effort and we're, we're trying to do something that um, we feel will be in addition to the work that uh, is being done by the wingmakers themselves, and it's our contribution um, for good or ill. Uh, the best we can to uh, help the Wingmakers community uh, communicate more easily with one another and to offer our own ideas on this whole wonderful topic. And uh, that kind of gets into the next uh, point here that I think is important to mention is uh, uh, what will the show include? You know, what will be the general uh, format of the show? Uh, we intend to... Uh, uh, read the material and discuss it. Uh, either that will be, um, you know, part of a particular reading or a document or an entire document, let's say a Lyricus Discourse. We might read a Lyricus Discourse and discuss that on the air. Uh, or we could just discuss a particular topic. We may have a discussion about the genetic mind or DNA or any of the other interesting topics that come up in Wingmakers. Uh, we intend to play some music. Uh, the Wingmakers music is really important. Very important because of the uh, way in which it can uh, relate to us on a, on a universal scale that anyone that can on the globe can understand it or because it is global. He's taken parts of all the different cultures. He? Who is he? Well, James, who creates these wonderful music, lays music on top of music, but mm -hmm. you can hear all the different instruments on the globe and each uh, kind of um, ethnic background that's on the culture is represented, so it's kind of global, so everyone can really uh, relate to it if, they, if it resonates with them. Yeah, as opposed to like the uh, the written material that has to be translated. And there's a lot of uh, various people have uh, contributed their time and energy to translate the materials, and those can be found on the uh, Wingmakers site right. on the downloads page, right. uh, different languages that uh, the material has been translated into. So that's a good point, though, about the music. It's a universal language. 
as a universal language, then you don't have to wait for someone in another country with another language to translate it. Once the disc comes out, everybody can hear it and under, you know, participate in the activity of it. Mm -hmm. Very, very true. Very true. Uh, the other point, uh, the next item, uh, we'd like to, uh, when it's appropriate, uh, bring you news of the day you know, from different areas of science or culture, whatever, that pertains to the Wingmaker's mission, which is to uh, uh, guide humanity uh, into a, the discovery of the soul, the new discoveries that have to do with consciousness, with psychology, with cosmology, with DNA, all those things that bear uh, on that one goal of the Grand Portal, uh, there are news items that appear from week to week or almost daily uh, that can be brought up. Uh, we're certainly not going to be ambitious enough to or be able to bring you all those news items. But if there are ones we see or ones that are sent to us, and if they look like something interesting, we'll talk about them in one part of the show. Well, you could use as an example the Lyricus Discourse Sex, which talks about heart codes. And there's a book called The Heart Codes by Paul Pearsall. And as I was looking through the... Um, the Hearts Code, yeah. As I was looking through the uh, Internet one day, I saw that in Cleveland, I believe it is, that they're starting a new clinic, and it will be a clinic that's based on studying the relationship between the code of the heart and the code of the brain. Instead of it being brain-heart, it's going to be what does the heart do wow. to impact the brain. So that's exactly what Discourse 6 is talking about. So it's kind of really up-to-date, new information that's running right along with the Discourse itself. Very interesting. Very, that's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about news. So that's, that's a very good example of, of what we will try to do. And the last part of uh, the show's format will include you out there. Uh, you're welcome to send email comments and questions to us at info at planetworkpress.com I-N-F-O at planetworkpress.com When we get those, we'll answer them at the next at the next uh, show. Yeah. Uh, we may not be able to answer every question. We don't even know if anyone will even send anything or we don't even know if anyone out there is even listening to this, but uh, we're here. We're going to be... Uh, uh, looking for your emails, and uh, that'll be part of the group experiment here to see uh, how this give and take back and forth goes, and uh, we'll just see how it how it goes. I, that's all. I think uh, it has uh, some good potential. It could be a lot of fun, and I think there's always something to be learned uh, both ways, as the audience shares with us and as we share with the audience. Sounds like a brilliant idea. Well, with that, why don't we take a short break and uh, we'll play a little bit of Wingmakers music. And by the way, all the music that we play here will be by the Wingmakers. We don't intend to be playing music by anyone else. Uh, this is a Wingmakers Lyricus broadcast, and therefore we will devote all the music to uh, Wingmakers. So we'll be back in a second or two or a few minutes, depending on how much we enjoy listening to this music.
Okay, we're back now for our break, and we hope you enjoyed the music that we were playing. We certainly did. And uh, it's time, darling, to get to uh, the main topic of the show, which is really to introduce uh, the Wingmakers materials and Lyricus materials to the uh, audience. I mean, there are probably many people out there that are already familiar with it all, but uh, I think it's for the sake of logic, if nothing else, and our own sanity, we need to at least try to describe uh, these materials to to our audience. I think that since there is such a wide variety of them, it is important that we kind of give each of them an overview of, of what it's all about. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we have a nice list here that Darlene had put together of um, all the main materials that are available. And... Uh, I guess, first of all, I should just say that uh, uh, the material itself is really designed as a catalyst. Uh, the materials are there on the website, and they consist of uh, a novel, and they consist of poetry and graphic images. Uh, there are paintings. Uh, there are music samples to listen to on the website, and then you can order those music CDs. There's a DVD that's been prepared that's quite nice. Uh, there are philosophy papers and poetry. Um, what did I forget? Now, that's the general. That's the general gist. And all of those materials that are designed to stimulate and inspire us uh, to begin to expand our vision of the world we live in and what the universe is all about. You know, is the reality around us simply our five senses? And you know, we're born, we live, we die, and that's the end of it. Uh, I know that the vast majority of our audience probably does not believe that. In fact, I don't think most rational people in the world really believe that we're just born, we live and die, and that's the end. Uh, and I think that's the point, is that the wingmakers are here to tell us that you know instinctively, <laughs> right, that there's a lot more to life than just that. You know that in your heart and in your brain, and we're here now to give you catalytic tools to kind of... Um, lift you up, to spark you, to discover uh, the science behind what uh, has always been in the past is simply beliefs, you know, religions. Yeah, in the past we've done it by intuition or we feel we know that this is true, but we never had any hard scientists to believe that it's true. Mm -hmm. And what this shows us that in the future there will be hard scientists, science proof, scientific proof, that says this is what the future is, this is a soul, we do have multi-dimensionality. Yeah, that, that uh, is exactly where I think uh, it's supposed to go and where it is going. And there are people out there, uh, scientists doing this kind of research. We may not hear a lot about them because uh, uh, the mainstream or uh, the world establishment, uh, the power structure out there, does not support... Uh, those types of fringe pioneering type of efforts. Um, and so, therefore, the, the real pioneers are often the people that are quietly working, um, tinkering around in their garages or basements or writing articles or have theories about these things. And they're, you know, it takes a lot of effort to get them presented and become more acceptable. But we'll eventually be getting into all those kinds of topics but that, in a nutshell, is basically what the wingmakers and lyricus materials are about. So um, why don't we get into the list a little bit here and um, talk about that. Uh, I think the first thing we have to talk about is the novel. Okay. And what's the name of that? The novel is called The Ancient Arrow. The Ancient Arrow Project. Novel. And this is a novel and which has kind of a mythical foundation to it. It's written as myth and it's and it's kind of a, a science fiction at the same time. So it's kind of a, a mixture of science fiction and myth. And we all like science fiction. We all love myths because we have myths going back into our ancient belief systems. Yeah, I mean, uh, the one thing they say about myth is every myth has a truth buried in it. And uh, uh, stories are built around nuggets of truth, and uh, therefore they're able to present in a, say, let's just face it, an entertaining way, something that engages one's attention, 
uh, might make you feel good or gets your emotions going. It draws you into a story. And the story itself, though, contains uh, uh, universal principles, perhaps, or great truths that uh, may not be obvious at first. And all the great modern uh, stories have contained that. And that's the whole basis of Star Wars and uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, all those kinds of stories really contained uh, the fundamentals about good and evil and uh, human nature and the struggle to overcome adversity and to be, you know, to be the hero. You know, uh, not that we want to be a hero, but you become a hero by simply uh, uh, learning how to overcome uh, adversity in, in life. Are you really saying that each of us then is on a journey to find the hero within ourselves as we overcome everyday life? <laughs> well, let's, let's put it this way, that a lot of us who have beliefs that are a, a bit on the edge uh, compared to what uh, many in the mainstream uh, believe in, yes, I think we are uh, uh, in that category, so to speak. We, even if it's in our own tiny little life, uh, we don't, not too many people know about us, but our families. But we may represent that microcosmic uh, hero, you know, struggling uh, <laughs> against the tides of the general belief systems of the world to say, you know, I think it's a little bit different than what what you're saying. I think it's a whole lot different than the reality that's being presented. And uh, that's what makes the Ancient Arrow Project novel uh, very interesting. Uh, it's the story in general uh, of the hero, the head of the story, Dr. Jamison Neruda. Is taking his hero's journey. Yeah, and he, you know, he... Uh, works for the super secret government agency, the ACIO, the Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization. And uh, he's a, uh, uh, a specialist, a scholar in ancient languages, and he's also a, um, uh, a genius at cryptography. And uh, Would that be encoding? That's all about codes, yeah. And uh, so that's kind of curious in itself that the Wingmaker's material contains codes and Dr. Neruda is an expert in, in codes and uh, an expert in ancient languages. And, uh, but doesn't this take place in, in New Mexico with an ancient site? Yeah. Uh, well, the ACIO is headquartered, I believe, in the story uh, in California, mm -hmm. but... Uh, some college students find a, a strange stone in the desert in New Mexico near Chaco Canyon, and um, one thing leads to another, and the stone ends up in the possession of the ACIO, and they they find out that the the um, the symbols on the stone are uh, symbolic of a location, I believe, and that this is a homing device. And one thing leads to another, and a team is sent out there, headed by Dr. Neruda, to Chaco Canyon, and um, uh, they do find this device becomes activated, and they discover uh, this cavern. Uh, and this cavern looks like it's uh, been artificially created, and it's in the form of a spiral, and uh, a spiral passageway. And they travel this passageway, and they, they find these small chambers, and inside each chamber is a painting um, that's like a, it's a piece of art hanging on the wall, or attached to the wall of these chambers, uh, and in each chamber also is found a strange object that looks like it's an artifact of some sort. Um, but they, the story does not go into a lot of detail as yet. But these other artifacts, uh, you have the painting that seems to be linked to art, and the other seems to be linked to technology. So those two items are found in each chamber. And then what happens? They get to the 23rd chamber at the very top. And they find that there's a little there's a mystery. Yeah, there's a there's a mystery there. There's a painting there, but instead of uh, these sort of uh, common-looking crystal-like objects that they think are technological artifacts, uh, they find what looks like a, a CD or a laser disc, an optical disc, and uh, that eventually gets decoded in their supercomputers back at their labs. And from that optical disc comes the music of the wingmakers, the philosophy of the wingmakers, the graphical images, mathematical formulas. Poetry. And poetry all are on this disc. And the disc, I believe, in the story 
it's about over 8,000 pages of data are translated by their computers about this. And uh, uh, the story is just fascinating because at a certain point, uh, Dr. Neruda feels he gets a message from the wingmakers themselves through this disc, and they communicate to him that uh, uh, they have found they have left six other sites in the world. That the site in New Mexico they created, and there are six other sites around the world that uh, he needs to discover. And his discovery and unlocking of the secrets of these seven sites uh, will expand and uplift the consciousness of humanity and ultimately will save us from a group of aliens that are coming to our planet uh, that uh, are going to try to take us, that may may not have our best best interests in mind. Right, exactly. And that group, they are called the Animus. And, of course, the story has various subplots in it. Uh, The main subplot is that the the head of the ACIO uh, is a gentleman named Fifteen, and um, he is a genius. What does 15 stand for? Uh, that's his security code. There are um, security levels in this group, and they go up to 15. And 15 is the only one with that level, and so he's called 15. And his, like, advisory group, I think their I think their levels are like 13, 14, or something to that effect. But, you know, the detail there is... Uh, uh, not so important at this point, but that's part of the story. And uh, uh, people who haven't read that story should definitely um, get the first source CD and read it. Um, you can download part of the story right directly from the website, but that is only half of the information you'll get on the version that's on the CD. And to make it a little more complicated, so just pay attention, even the information you get on the CD is only about Uh, 25% of the entire novel. The entire Wingmaker's novel, the ancient Arrow project, has not been published yet. Only one quarter of it has been. So in effect, I guess to get past that part, uh, if you download it off the website, you're getting about 12.5%. And if you buy the CD, you'll get the first 25% of the novel. Right. I think they've so used well. an interesting technique in the website in that uh, not only do you have the novel that is part of the whole story or a foundation of the story, Dr. Neruda then gives a set of interviews to a reporter. And this day and age, uh, we know how important information is given to a reporter mm-hmm. and how that That's can right. be put out on the Internet or on the news or however, so this is a new way in which to expand the information that you want and not have it directly in the novel. Exactly. I I think it was just an ingenious idea. The the, uh, Neruda interviews, as they're called, are all available on the website uh, for download. And they're just fascinating. They, what do they run, about 40 to 50 some pages Pages, each. Mm -hmm. So you've got about 200 pages of fascinating information. And uh, uh, to, to give the readers, uh, yeah, the readers, the uh, I'm so used to writing, I'm, I'm saying readers, but to give the listeners uh, a little bit of general idea on this, uh, Dr. Neruda feels that he has to defect from the ACIO, so he, he defects. And in order to uh, protect the story and everything he knows, uh, he enlists the aid of uh, this journalist, this journalist uh, named, uh, named Sarah. And um, he, um, he gives her, uh, there are five interviews, only four have been published to date. And uh, so we've been waiting for this fifth interview for a couple of years now. I think it's been almost about no, going on two years. November of 2002, 2002 was the third interview. Or the fourth interview, excuse me, fourth interview. So it's it's going to be two, two years, years very soon. Um, Next month. Yeah, that uh, we've been waiting for this this fifth interview, and um, they range uh, uh, they range through many different topics. There are um, inf- information there about the aliens that the ACIO works with. Uh, they work with the Greys from uh, the Zeta Reticulon. 
they uh, work with a group called the Cordium. And the Cordium are uh, much closer to humanity in terms of affinity. And um, the ACIO doesn't work with the Greys very much at all. That was early on, but they are mentioned. Uh, there's this whole topic of uh, blank slate technology, which is the pet project of 15. I don't think we got to that no, we when we were talking about the novel. But blank slate technology is the highest form of time travel known in the universe. And um, the Cordium, who are from another galaxy, have told 15 uh, that, uh, that information. Uh, he is a genius who has always been fascinated with time travel. And when he became head of the ACIO and was introduced to the Cordium, who were already part of the secret government uh, pact with them, uh, they informed him that, that this form of time travel was the most advanced. So they have uh, basically uh, put their minds together, the Cordium and the humans in this project, to find uh, the answer to the time travel. And time travel will not just be able to uh, go into the past or the future in order to uh, observe it, but to actually go there and change it uh, with the bare minimum of effects on and repercussions uh, of the event in, of the event in in the real world back in the time that it's happening. It's a little difficult to explain for sure, but I, I think people get the idea. Uh, some other topics in these interview have to do with uh, UFOs and politics, uh, secret organizations, uh, something called LERM. What was that called? Do you remember the light, light encoded? Yeah, the light, uh, I think it's light emitting uh, reality matrix. That's right. And Almost seems like the matrix. Yeah, it's a, uh, well, maybe, yeah, it's, but it's uh, made up of light like filaments filament. that can be, uh, that, that the members of the ACIO, really the Labyrinth Group, which, by the way, the Labyrinth Group is a, another secret organization that is 15 inside. created inside the ACIO. And the ACIO doesn't even know that the Labyrinth Group exists. And I guess to finish that topic off, the ACIO is part of the National Security Agency, the NSA, and that's unacknowledged. So the NSA will never acknowledge ACI, ACIO exists. So all these things are embedded in the story. So in a way, uh, the story and the interviews contain truth, uh, but also... Uh, Things that are maybe not true in the right. sense that they've been embellished, they've been enhanced to make the story more interesting, but there are many things in the story that are true. Is there really a Dr. Neruda? People have asked us that at workshops. And uh, Dr. Neruda is a character that's been created for the story. All these people in the story are characters created for the story, but there may very likely be uh, people who um, uh, part of their story make up that story. They are composites. There are real people who, so there are Neruda-like scientists. There are 15-like uh, heads of organizations uh, who are unacknowledged and you'd never know who they were. So the characters represent composite figures in the real world uh, and that's where the real part of the story um, interfaces with the fictional, fictionalized part of the story. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that the interviews talk about. They talk about the music and the paintings and the poetry because Dr. Neruda, the journalist, is asking him, right? She's oh, saying, yeah, she wants to know all the questions. What is this whole project about? What do you mean paintings? And what do you mean about... This cavern, uh, like yeah, who are these wing makers? Yeah. And what about this DNA? And what does that have to do with the whole thing and these pictures? And, and uh, how, how, do po how does poetry fit into this? And what is the culture? You're talking about a cultural thing, and what's culture in this regard? So these interviews, uh, as Darlene is showing you, that they, they are fascinating because the the journalist is not an expert in any one field. She's just a regular general type of, of reporter uh, who he found because he wanted a regular person who was competent as a reporter, but he didn't want somebody who was a science a science reporter, somebody like that, because they would have too many technical questions and they would probably be prejudiced against um, many of the things that he needed to explain. 
And why was it that he wanted to get this out? Because he felt that if this got out into the public domain and the public understood it and heard about it, that his life would be safe from being wiped out by the ACIO. Yeah, they wanted, They had this uh, MRP, uh, what is that called? A memory restructure procedure in the uh, ACIO. And what it means he, that they could put you on a, on a table and wipe out your memory and you would not remember what you knew. That's right. But they would only go in and it would only take out that particular part of the memory. They wouldn't destroy everything. It's just that you would no longer, he would no longer know about the H and Arrow project and he didn't want to lose his memory about the wingmakers. Yes, because they had such an impact on him, the information they gave him. He just knew that it was true and knew that, you know, this was what humanity really needed. So um, that gives you some idea of the interview. I'd like to say something like. about the fourth interview, though, John. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. you, ha you have to really understand that the fourth interview came out in November of 2002. And one of the things that really piqued our curiosity was it said that there would be a, a worldwide oil crisis in that interview. Yeah, it was a possibility. Good. It was right. brought up, right, as a possibility. As, as a way to unite humanity mm -hmm. with a common problem. And as you and I have looked at the news lately, what we always keep seeing is there's something called peak oil, and we now have oil prices at the top of the list, and it's now it's it's fifty four dollars a barrel right, right now, right, something of that right, effect. Where it was twenty seven or less than that, and so now we really are seeing a build up of a crisis with oil, whereas that interview kind of foreshadowed the the, 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 the kind of like uh, the uh, myth of the interview kind of foreshadowed the truths of today. That's right. That's very that's very true. Yeah. And um, I don't think it, it did not say that that was right around the corner necessarily, but maybe at about 20 years or yeah. we don't it, but it was just an example of how what type of a crisis would it take to um, right. uh, bring humanity to bring together. humanity together uh, that eventually we're going to be forced to, either by something good or by something bad to work together. Uh, unfortunately, it's usually some kind of a bad crisis uh, that brings people together. And so I think the whole point is the fourth interview gets down to the real nitty-gritty of the situation humanity is in today right. and the hope that it offers for the future oh, in yeah. terms of discovery of the soul and these other dimensions uh, of reality that are really going to change the entire playing field in the, in the domains of, of religion, especially um, government and our culture, and our science. social. And science. And science, uh, of course, uh, science will lead the way, though, eventually, because these will be scientifically proven um, experiments that are going to begin to shift the whole world view of the scientific community into a new area. Okay. So, as probably you all out there can hear the way we're talking about these interviews, we find them very exciting and very intriguing, um, a whole other dimension to the novel itself. Uh, which really, uh, that brings us up to the next thing on our list, that there's a lot of philosophy in the uh, Wingmaker's material. Uh, there are four philosophy papers that have been written, and they average anywhere from 11 to 18 pages, something in that. But I'll have to tell you, <laughs> those 11 to 18 pages in each one are just packed uh, with pretty heavy information. This is not um, uh, fluff. This is it's not light reading. <laughs> it's not light reading. It's not just fluff and words that are repeated just to make you give you feel good sensation and send you on your way. Uh, they're really designed to, to make you think. And uh, we've read these philosophy papers five, six times uh, together uh, in our local group that we have here in our community. And with we've studied them uh, a little bit in our workshop environment when we've had a chance. Uh, but I'll just read off the titles of these. We're not going to go into detail on that to, today, but just to give you an idea. Uh, the first one is called Life Principles of the Sovereign Integral. 
Uh, number two is shifting models of existence. The third one is a blueprint for exploration. And number four, uh, beliefs and their energy systems. And the fourth one um, is the first one in which um, a few specific exercises were given uh, that people could perform on their own that uh, relate the, uh, the paintings, uh, the poetry, and uh, the music uh, as um, devices or tools, resources, for getting in touch with the deeper levels of your own self. Use them as activation tools to uh, getting into the beginning of the journey, of the inner journey to the self. Yes. Uh, later, we get to the Lyricus materials, and one of those papers, they're, they're called activation resources, and that's what these are in the fourth philosophy paper. Uh, one of which involves um, the paintings, working with four of the paintings. Right. Uh, you have to look at the symbols in the painting, and there's a whole exercise for the symbols involved. It's painting number two, three, twelve, and four. Right. Uh, they have to do with uh, uh, time. New dimensions in time. New dimensions in time. Uh, space. New dimensions in space. That's number three. Uh, energy is 12. New dimensions in energy. And matter. New dimensions in matter. Yeah. So it kind of takes you out That's of... That's number the, four. Right. Four it takes you out of the idea of what we think of these as now. How can you think of them in a new form and what do these, do the pictures kind of represent in that idea? Yes, exactly. It's exactly. And it, uh, the paintings themselves are just absolutely fascinating. Um, do we... I guess we could talk about the paintings right now. Mm -hmm. though. Yeah. Be good. Yeah, there are um, uh, 24 chamber paintings right. all together. And uh, there are 10 uh, portal. portal paintings that are uh, quite fascinating. And uh, they seem to be a, a they are like a, what I call like a master painting. They, we've done some research and found that Many of the symbols found in the ten portal paintings uh, are transferred or found in the 24 Transfer chamber paintings. Right. And we've identified something like, I think it was about 66 unique symbols that uh, are contained in the portal paintings that are then found in the 24 uh, right. chamber paintings. And, and you won't find the portal paintings on the website. They're only on the CD from... So uh, if you go to the web website and look for the portal paintings, they're not there. They're only on the, on the CD-ROM. What I found fascinating about them is that there are some pictures that really just resonate with you, and some it takes time to get used to. <laughs> and the f 24 uh, paintings uh, kind of represent the 24 DNA of one's DNA. So it has a relationship between our DNA and um, the paintings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they uh, they they are just uh, they're filled with symbols that um, are definitely uh, accessible in terms of interpretation. It, right. it isn't that they're so cryptic you right. can't understand them, but uh, but they're also they're like Zen koans. They're like also on the edge of your ability to access. They seem to be on the edge of the conscious mind and they sort of uh, fall over that ledge a little, or at least lead you over the edge into a deeper part of the mind uh, or consciousness. So they are designed as, as tools, as the same way with the poetry, to pull you beyond who you are to who you really are. You know, Maybe it's a good way to put it. Right. And I think the other thing is that you look at them, and one time you'll see something, and the next time you look at them and you'll see something else. And it's kind of like an ongoing uh, understanding of what the painting represents to you, to your yes. inner self. It doesn't necessarily mean what it means to anybody else, but what does it mean to you? It's kind of individual in that respect. Excellent point. Well, why don't we just take another little break here, and then we'll come back and go through uh, the rest of the material.
Thank you, John and Darlene Burgess, for an interesting program about the Wingmakers. Now, we have another full hour of this program in which they continue their discussions and demonstrations about the Wingmakers that will feature later this week. Uh, John and Darlene Burgess did a fantastic job, and John's been dedicated to the Wingmakers for some time. As you know, if you've listened to this show. Well, with the music from the Wingmakers in the background, I thought we would close out the program. I'd like to thank Larry Dickin, our executive producer, and he did the production and editing today. How about that? Times are tough when the executives have to do the work, huh, Larry? Until next time, this is Jerry Pippen. Thank you for listening to the UFO Files. Cheers. <laughs>